Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel. I'm CTO of Picnic, and we have a very simple mission. We want to make grocery shopping simple, fun, and affordable for absolutely everyone. But our growth story started a couple of years back with a very simple observation. And our observation was that everybody, every of us, is currently shopping online for electronics, for books, for fashion, already to a rate of something like 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. So that means this is a retail industry which has been already disrupted online. But there is another market, which is the food industry, roughly the same size. To be honest, it's even the biggest consumer market on Earth, which is de facto not online. Here in Netherlands, just one, one to two percent is currently online in the food. In other countries like US, it's a little bit more, around uh, four to five percent. In the UK, six percent. But in essence, it is pretty, pretty small still with respect to online. And when we looked in the market and we talked to a couple of people, then everybody told us, well, guys, uh, this is a pretty small market. It's a complicated business. Why do you go into this? And if somebody tells us there is a small market and just 2% is online, then what we see from an entrepreneurship angle is that there's a 98% opportunity. First insight. So what we asked as the first question is, why is nobody shopping online in the food industry? So the question why is, is there something which is actually holding back people? And we identified three main reasons. And this is something what probably every kind of growth story has a kind of a starting point. The first one is, it has been pretty expensive to shop for food online. What has happened until 2015 is that everybody had to pay for the deliveries. And there was no price parity with the offline uh, alternative. Have you seen this before? We have. In the fashion industry, something similar happened also. Until 2005, you had to pay to get your fashion, your shoes, your dress delivered to your home. And also, you had to pay for the return. And then Zalando and Zappos came and simply said, well, you can order for free with us, and you, you also don't pay for the return. And that broke up the entire market. And by now, there's already 30% of this market online. And we saw this as an example to do this also in food. But there's more. Besides being expensive, it is, people had to wait. And waiting is not a big issue if you wait for a dress or a book. But if somebody tells you, we deliver food between 4 and 8 p.m., then you don't know, can you use it for dinner? So if you deliver at 4 or 5, then you can use it for dinner. But at 8 p.m., we can't. So obviously, waiting is not an option. You need to have much sharper delivery windows. And the third one is that actually the interfaces have been extremely cumbersome. And that is also logical. Everybody took this kind of app or the web shop that worked pretty well for electronics to the, uh, to the grocery industry. But if you shop just for three or four or five items and you compare a lot of products, then your interface looks very different than if you shop for uh, groceries. For groceries, you shop for 30, 40, 50 items. Everything what you buy this week, you have bought already at some point in your life before. What you buy this week, you have bought already 80% of what you buy this week, you have bought uh, also last week. Doesn't matter how hipster you are. So this is a simple fact. So therefore, interfaces need to be looking different. So we came up with a value proposition which looks as follows. You can shop with us at lowest price, with our delivery fees, and we deliver all the food that you love to your door. And if you like, even uh, to, into your kitchen. So that's a pretty tough uh, value proposition. Let me show you a short video which shows a bit how it looks like from a consumer angle, and then I will make a, di a deep dive into our kind of growth story and which kind of growth challenges we had to tackle for this. Let's see if uh, some audio works here.
this is how it looks like from a consumer angle. But in essence, to build up a service, which is now live in nearly 50 cities here in the Netherlands and recently uh, uh, also expanded to Germany, actually comes up with a couple of challenges. And these are the really interesting things that in such a kind of a growth setup are interesting for you guys. So how did we build it up? And I want to talk to you through kind of four interesting challenges that we have seen and that most of you will probably see also in your businesses. So the first one is what we call the mobile shopping challenge. And the mobile shopping challenge is something that you want to make it as simple as possible, as convenient as possible for customers to shop for all the food you sell off. So our ambition is that you can shop for 30 articles. So that's typically 30, 40, 50 articles. is what you shop uh, in a supermarket in only three minutes. That's a pretty tough proposition. So we came up with a solution that goes beyond what has been existing here. So the typical kind of approach how you do this, for instance, in a service like Amazon or other services, is that you make a recommender system. And the recommender system offers a kind of a single product that you buy. But in essence, this is not good enough for food. Because if you actually shop for 50 products, then you need to recommend 50 products. And you need to recommend 50 products properly to really fill the basket. So therefore, we need to go at one step further. And one step further means that you actually recommend sets of products. And sets of products means that you uh, actually recommend products that are bought together or that the customer wants to buy it together. But the challenge here is, is that actually, if you have a recommender system with a likelihood of, let's say, 90% that you recommend the right product, then 12 products in one go to recommend in a proper way is something where you end up with a likelihood of just 30%. So therefore, your likelihood that you buy or that you uh, recommend proper products with the right recommendation needs to be much, much higher. And the first insight and the first learning that we had here is something what you, that you need two things. The first thing that you need is something what is big data. All of us have heard about it. And big data means you need to have actually transactional data from a large set of customers. But there is one thing which is even more important, what most people are not considering in their recommender system. And this is something what is deep data. And deep data means actually that per customer that you have a long shopping history. If you have only transactional data for a lot of customers, but uh, then only one or two transactions, then this is not good enough. Your recommender system won't be good enough. You need to have, for a large set of customers, a deep uh, order history to actually recommend properly. And that is something which you can see here in the middle of the, uh, of the graph. But this itself is kind of the first insight that I want to give, uh, give you on your way. Second one is the challenge which we call the distribution challenge. And distribution means how do you bring your products from the warehouse from a farmer to your customers. Actually, you want to bring it at the shortest possible route, at the shortest possible time, in a very narrow time window, and always on time. Funny fact, the, on, the no show rates, which is typically in a postal service 20, 30%, is in our case much smaller. And this is also clear, because obviously in food, if you're not at home, you don't have something to eat. So therefore, that is something which is a little bit easier in our context. And the really interesting part is, if you have a service and if you have a sufficient density, you start to build a distribution model which is not optimizing for the fastest route or for the shortest distance because the density is pretty high. So it's pretty easy to go between your customers. You optimize or you try to understand how long does every stop with a customer take. We don't have the fastest cars. We don't have the biggest cars. But we are striving to have the smartest cars. So in our context, this looks as follows. You see here an electric vehicle that we are driving our groceries to customers. And those vehicles are not super fast. Other retailers have uh, faster vehicles. These are also not the biggest ones. But what we do is we want to understand how long does it take to actually to deliver a single to a customer. Because this is pretty different between different kind of customers. And let me show you the formula on the right hand side, how we do this. So there's first an area constant. So we need to understand how easy is it to find a parking spot in the area. In some areas, it's easy. In some areas, you have more one-way roads and it's a little bit harder. Second one is a pretty interesting aspect. For the first-time delivery, we need to spend some extra time with the customer. Customers have asked questions. How does the app work? How does the return work? And many other kind of aspects. So this is something what we take also into account in our model. We don't want to chase our uh, runners. So these are our delivery guys. But we want to have a model which actually takes this property into account. Third component pretty straightforward, how much do we deliver there? 
if you deliver just one toad with uh, a couple of bananas, then this is obviously faster to be done than if it's a kind of uh, three toads or four toads with a lot of products. And the real magic in such a model is in the last component. I call this here on the slide uh, T-delta. And what you see here is that you actually take into account, for instance, do we have a daytime delivery or a night delivery? What happens at night is that it's harder to find a parking spot, it's harder to find a house, it's harder to find actually your way around. In our case, it takes around 23 seconds longer. But there's more. You need to also understand, can you enter the house on the front or in the back? Do you go to the first or the second floor? All these are parameters that we are taking into account to deliver or to understand how long it takes to deliver always on time. And the reason why this is important is if you deliver in a 20-minute window, this means you have an ETA plus minus 10 minutes. But if you deliver 10 times, let's say to 10 customers, and if you are just one minute off for every customer, obviously you're easily out of the window. So this is something which you really need to understand very well, how much time you spend for a customer. But besides having a smart distribution model, there is one second component that uh, played a fundamental role for us. And that is the component that we make our delivery experience a kind of a co-experience with customers. What we do is that our customers can see in real time that we are delivering to the customer where the driver is. So what you see now here in the app is that we have a runner. On top, you see that Marco is on its way. He is now just five minutes away. will deliver to the address of Bomberg 4, and the customers can follow this. Half of the customers are opening the app and see where is the runner. If you are in the garden, you can still decide what, uh, when do you go to the door. What we see is, obviously, it's a gamification component. Customers like it. It's very close to Uber, Lyft, and whatever other delivery services. But the really interesting part, and that is something which is a kind of a gamification innovation component, is that now customers know up to the minute when we will be there. And that means also that they will be at the door whenever we, do, we ring the bell. So big and interesting uh, component. Third component is we have started as a mobile-only app. We know that web is probably dead. However, there will be a time after mobile. Nobody knows exactly what it is. But we know that there will be another interface coming after smartphones, or maybe complementary to smartphones, that will be also relevant for e-commerce. So what we want to do is that you can actually shop at every point in time all the products that you like. And the interesting thing is that you want to shop at the point when you're running low on the products. So you are st you're standing in your kitchen, you're running low on butter, low on milk, low on uh, meat, and at this point in time, you just want to tell your app that you want, with the next shopping trip, uh, or actually buy this product. In the past, everybody did this with a small sticky note on the fridge where you wrote it down. Customers now open the app and add this to the, pro uh, to the basket, the product. But the future and the next step is that you actually just use voice. I want to show you now in the next video how we do this actually with Alexa, but obviously every kind of voice interface uh, will also do. Okay, I'm going to briefly show you what our prototype for the picnic skill does, and we're going to add some groceries to our basket. For example, Alexa, ask picnic to add banana. Okay, I have added banana to your picnic basket. And then we go check on our basket and the banana is there. We can also say, Alexa, ask Picnic to add coffee. Okay, I have added coffee to your picnic basket. And it is also there. So we can ask, Alexa, ask Picnic what's in my cart. Currently, your cart has two articles worth 9.38 euros. Okay, and then we also introduced some speech counts, which are the phrases that Alexa say more expressively. So, for example, Alexa, ask Picnic to add broccoli. Yuck! I mean, I have added broccoli to your picnic basket. And then we can just add, ask more, one more time, Alexa, ask Picnic what's in my cart. Currently, your card has three articles, worth 11.13 euros. Okay, uh, this is uh, the demo. Uh, we will submit this skill for certification later this year, so all of our customers can have it available. Yes, 
interfaces. So this is the voice interface. And obviously, there are also other interfaces uh, that are actually uh, syncable in this kind of context. But this is something uh, where we see uh, quite a bit of demand from uh, different kind of customers. And the last one, and this is uh, something which is actually, it's a tech conference, so we need to also talk a bit about engineering. Because obviously, engineers make it possible that all this tech will also be available for all our customers. And one of the really interesting challenges that we have seen on our growth journey is the engineering challenge of fair code reviews. And fair code reviews means the following. You have a couple of product teams that build on your platform, and then uh, the product teams are actually focusing on building their own products. But in order to have a proper quality control, you want to have that one of your, en that, uh, your engineers are controlling and uh, reviewing each other's code. So how do you make it possible that even if the incentivation is that everybody focuses on his own product, that there's also a team of engineers that refuse each other's code. And the solution for this is something what we took from uh, the blockchain industry. And the blockchain industry works similar to kind of P2P networks, that you build a kind of a score of a participant in the network that takes into account how much you contribute to the network versus how much you actually take from the network. And exactly the same is also applicable in the engineering world. So what you do is you build a ratio between how much you review for other teams versus how much you read for your review of your own code. And then, based on this ratio, you actually can also have a small cryptocurrency that you actually share with your engineers. And based on this kind of uh, cryptocurrency, uh, engineers are collecting uh, then uh, the cryptocurrencies, and you can, uh, you can actually cash it in one or the other way with small gadgets and all kind of other, other tools. And that is something what has helped us from kind of independent, isolated product teams to go to a team culture where everybody works on the common vision of our platform. And that is something what I encourage everybody also to look into. Last but not least, I have a couple of messages that I want to take you, give you on the way that we have learned in our journey. And these are the learnings that we have done, uh, have taken uh, from, uh, from uh, Picnic as a kind of a scale-up. So the first one is, beside uh, having a big dream, you need to act small. And that means, sim in simple terms, that you need to get started with something. Don't make too complex plans. You need to actually have a small plan too and a first iteration that you need to get quickly in the hands of your customers. But there's more. Beside all the data, and everybody talks about data and AI, what you can do with it, but even more important is that you complement your data with your mission and the vision that you have on your customers. Third one is, before you go into any kind of AI, and this is a kind of a big hype these days, you should do your homework on the data science side. And doing homework on data science means understanding is the data good enough, do we have sufficient amount of data, do we have stable data, etc. This is certainly non-trivial, but this will actually avoid, make, make it possible that you avoid uh, big kind of investment mistakes on the AI side. The last two things are something which we learned uh, during the journey and is really still a kind of a continuing example. You need to launch first and scale later. Don't think too early about a scalable solution because 80% won't work at all. So why do you build a scalable solution of something which you will throw away anyway? So first build a prototype that you actually uh, bring to in the hands of your customers and then later think about a scalable solution and maybe re-implement the solution in order to have it scalable. And the fifth one is something which is probably for all of you guys in the start and scale-up world, something which is a bit of refreshing uh, insight. The embrace that your team is small, that you have not enough resources. Great products come from small teams. Doesn't matter if it's Instacart or if it's WhatsApp or any other uh, product. Small teams means that you focus on the stuff that is really relevant uh, for your customers. That brings me to the end of the, uh, my talk. Thanks a lot for your attention.